Сей крест установлен как хранитель этих заветных мест и как напоминание о долге человека беречь природу и приумножать богатство ее для будущих потомков. Deep inside Russia's Arctic tundra, a reserve has been founded. A pristine place where nature is in balance and fishermen thrive. The Atlantic Salmon Reserve was created in 2003 by Peter C. Power. The fishing here was very run down at the time, but uh, it was still better than fishing you can get elsewhere in the world. Uh, for multiple sea winter fish. It's a very, very special zone. It's at the end of the range. But um, yes, of course, the fishing was very exciting. But what was more exciting was the, uh, the fact that you <coughs> there had been massive deterioration, enormous poaching, the, uh, the past stocks were, were going down. And this was a real opportunity to do something in life and, and uh, improve the rivers in a way that <coughs> is very, very difficult elsewhere in the world, because here, no people live. The only people here are the people I employ. So you have complete control. So if you have the cooperation of the authorities, you can do remarkable things. There, there. Yeah, this side of this room is full. Just right there. Just right here, full yeah. of salmon. Not in the very rough, just to the left. Well, they're just all over. There's nothing better than the military pool on the incoming tide. It's my favorite place in the river. Let's go. It's so special here because you're just so far away from the modern world. There's this peace and balance on the North Coast, um, like the mink that ran by us earlier, and the fresh salmon that have traveled thousands of miles that you just saw. 
coming in from the North Sea. North of here is the North Pole. There's nothing out there. Um, that, no mobile phones, no contact. And I, I think after a few days, it's just so, it's like therapy coming here. And I think it's, it's another reason that the popularity and a lot of the, the guests returning every year. It's good to completely get away to kind of find yourself so that you know who you are when you go back and, and get back to work there in the city. I feel very comfortable like I finally found my spot. I've been moving around my whole life, but um, these northern rivers are wild, uh, unpredictable, and I think that you just never know what could happen, what could come up these rivers. And for me, every time I step on the rock, even though I've been here a long time, I still get this excitement when I pull the line off, not knowing what could happen. The Atlantic Salmon Reserve is located 175 kilometers east of Murmansk along the unspoiled north coast of Russia's Kola Peninsula. The ASR has two main lodges, which are located along the banks of the Karlovka and the Rinda rivers. We have 500 rods, what are, what are fishermen or fisher ladies, about 100. 35 of those are what we call trout rods, and uh, the rest are salmon fishermen. It starts off actually with what I call the happy faces, turning grown, sophisticated men into boys, you know, who clamber off helicopters with their rods in their hands as if the Vietnam War was still going on. That side of it is actually a reward in itself. I especially enjoy the really seriously skeptical Brit who's been through public school and he's trained not to be impressed immediately. And he comes off that helicopter pad with discerning looks, you know. By the evening he's smiling and laughing and having a good time with the rest of the world. And, and uh, of course it helps sustain that if you catch a lot of fish. And we do here, we catch a lot of fish and a lot of big fish. As there are no roads here, helicopters are used to transport everything in and out of the territory. These helicopters allow easy access to guests who are deployed every morning to remote locations throughout the river systems. This is my 16th week. I fished Kalovka and Litsa now 11 years in a row. I fish practically all over this planet where there's Atlantic salmon. And uh, these are uh, my favorite rivers. Litsa is, to me, it's, it's the best river there is. It's the most fun, the, uh, the biggest challenge, and it's got lots of big fish. This is one of the few uh, wilderness on the planet. I mean, uh, our part of the world, there's, there's very few places that's not affected by man. Look at this. I mean, when you, we, you find trails here and there, but that's trails from reindeer and maybe a bear. But there's no people living in this area. And it's, it's true wilderness. And fishing it now in June, you had a midnight sun, it's just, uh, if you like being out in the wilderness, it's, it's fantastic.
gonna weigh this little ridge of stones out and I fish down to the cliffs. I was here last night in the dark and I had an hour and I, I got two great fish, 120 and 118 pounders. Both of them were just covered of sea lice. They like to be over at that cliff in the deeper water and they follow into the shallow and take the flyer. Here we go. Oh shit. Pulled all my loop. If you're too nervous, you pull it away. Then you never get these fish. Have to be cool. Give them some time to turn over the fly. Here we go. Yep. Yeah. Woo! -hoo. It's coming up this current now. This little stream. Come on, I don't want to run down there. Come on, baby, please, please, don't do this to me. Please, stop, stop, stop there, right there. Come, 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 come to Dima. This is the best in life. I don't like hatcheries. I don't like artificial fishing. I like it wild and genuine. And this is this is like this is the way God once made it. It's just fantastic. Here we go. One more. I got one. Come on. Grab it. Yeah! There we go. Yeah! There we go. Yep. Yeah! Ha! Here we go. Yep. Yep, I'm on! First fish on a bomber this year. friend in Russia. <laughs> he's not a guide, he's a friend. For a lot of people who know salmon fishing pretty much all over the world, I guess the rinder's got to come right at the top of that. Partly because it's so varied um, and partly because there's always a chance of a big fish and then there's a big run of grills. It's a wonderful river. But I don't think anybody uh, would come on a holiday like this if it were just for the um, salmon fishing. I mean, it's the place, it's the tundra, um, it's the flowers, it's the birds, uh, it's the granite rocks, um, it's uh, helicoptering down um, from Zolotan along the coast and seeing a huge herd of reindeer on the beach there and the few remaining houses at the mouth of the Rinda. 
It's just a, 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 an absolutely fabulous experience. <laughs> you won't believe it. Well done, Peter. <laughs> Catching fish on camera. Well, well. That's our 44th fish of the week. Oh, well, is it? <laughs> there you go. I think one of the great um, joys of coming here are the friendships one makes. And I fish with uh, Jenya, and I wouldn't want to fish with anybody else. You spend a week with a guide, you become friends. And uh, I always say to Jenya at the beginning of the holiday, I'll improve your English if you'll improve my fishing. The most of the staff comes every year here. They like work here because it's a, first of all, it's a proper organization. Every, everybody knows what to do. They enjoy to be in Tandra instead of being somewhere in office and work in the factory in Murmansk. And the job is interesting, especially for guides. They are highly professional. I believe that our guides are the best in the world. And the guest also knows this and guys can feel it that they are highly professional they need it and they like it also all of them are fishermen fly fishermen so they like to be in the river they like to see salmon takes they like to find the big salmon try to catch it it's a nice team here a nice atmosphere in the camp and i think it's why people come here every year Nearly all the guides uh, that are here this week um, I've known for, you know, nine, ten years. Uh, they really know this place like the back of the hands. Uh, it's, I can't emphasise enough how important it is for people who are coming here for the first time that they must listen to the guides because these guys really know what they're talking about. It's my fourth season. I've been working for Northern Rivers Company as a fly fishing guide. Before I've been working at River. Everything is on a much higher level. All operations, management. But the main point that I prefer quality over quantity. And on our rivers here you can catch really a big fish. And one big fish worth hundreds of small. It's my opinion. And so in people, our guests who come here, they come here not just to catch salmon, but to catch a fish of their life. And they know that one perfect cast can change their life. And it just came up like a dry fly to take the fly. Change of fly, first change of fly. Help me to remember the tag number. 2914. <laughs> 2914. It's wonderful to see that this fish here has already been tagged, which is, which is a huge reflection on the actual conservation policy by these river systems to maintain such a wonderful runny fish. Jesus. Oh, 
think oh hell is going down unbelievable take and followed by one of the strongest runs I've ever felt in a fish this thing I don't know what size it is it's not massive fish it's a big fish but the power look at this here this is scary this is absolutely scary <laughs> Well done, well done. Top job. <laughs> there we are. 17 pounds. Ikerlovska's finest. Wonderful take. Phenomenal fish. What a wonderful creature. Sasha, thank you very much indeed. Thank You're you. Welcome. When I first arrived here, you initially think it's just um, it's just a camp in the middle of nowhere, but the level of attention to detail which goes into it, and tiny little things, you get dropped off by a helicopter, you go down to the river, and on the side of some of the beats, there's a fishing rod taped to a side of a tree in the middle of nowhere. Reason being, if you break your rod, you're too far away to go back and um, pick up another one. The camps. They've got walkways in between each one. Now that wasn't put there to make it more comfortable for guys to walk around. They're put there to protect the environment. So if you decide to lift these camps up and go away, there'll be almost no um, environmental impact left in the surroundings. And it's that sort of detail which just makes this place stand out far and above all the others. The camps of the ASR are truly impressive, like a small community in the middle of nowhere. Over a hundred Russian staff are employed to make sure that everything runs smoothly. Originally, um, when I started coming to Rinda, uh, we stayed in very um, quaint, small cabins. And as the years have gone on, um, more and more of the Plusher cabins have been kind of built, um, which you know, it's unbelievable that you can have that level of comfort um, in, you know, 200, 250 miles inside the Arctic Circle. All the cabins now have got uh, ensuite facilities, you know, very spacious, got lovely, you know, wardrobe, heated, warm your, uh, dry your waders out. It's incredible. It's like the Ritz. <laughs> The new ASR Tundra adventure programs are about getting back to the basics. Fishermen spend more time on the rivers, camping out half the week at tented camps. Some actually prefer their time in these remote camps to the luxurious lodge atmosphere. This is certainly the case for the trout fishermen, who seem to thrive camping out on the wild tundra. That's the sound of the tundra. Silence. There, there's no sign of civilization anywhere. So just see the tracks of reindeer. Nothing else. It's an amazing feeling. I do the trout program because A, it's a wonderful thing to do. I mean, these are pure trout left over from the Ice Age, you know, I mean, they're very, very special. And you know they can be huge. I mean, I've had one at 12 uh, pounds, you know, Norman. That's special. Actually, the people who fish for the trout are special. Uh, they have not a lot of money, and they just love being there. I mean, look at me today going out. I, I've done the run. I've been to six places today. And uh, they're ever so grateful, and they know damn well the program's subsidised. 
But that fits with the conservation program. If you're going to protect a river, you've got to protect the water basin. And so they're contributing uh, in, in, in their own way. Um, in fact, in a very important way, that we're out and about. And without that trout program, it would be extremely expensive. If you compare rivers around the world, you will, I think you can't find any river where you can have the same uh, fly fishing on brown trout. I feel I'm privileged to uh, be able to visit these uh, rivers. I've been here for 14 years and hopefully I will return as long as I have the possibility. Firewood we have mostly for winter time because we keep family here all winter. They're looking after camp for stove and for fireplace for sun. And we collect all the firewood on a bank of the Barren Sea. So it's moved by Barren Sea to the bank. What and we go with helicopter with big nets to cut it, to put in the nets and bring to the camps. And usually we get for winter. 10, 12 tons. The concept of the Atlantic Salmon Reserve, which is uh, uh, known as the home for salmon in Russia, is, uh, you can sum it up as a back to nature policy. Um, we protect what is here. I don't like calling on God, but anyway, the, the man, we want to put it, keep it the way the man upstairs intended. So that means we have to set an example. Um, uh, we have to make sure there is no poaching, there is no fish killing. We never even cut a tree, for example. Uh, we've collected wood from the sea. These trees are 300 years old because, of course, as soon as they get to a certain size, you know, you've got the permafrost underneath. We don't kill seals. We don't harass any animals here. We say those seals are here to improve the stock and, and uh, that uh, nature is in balance. We don't do any river engineering. There's rocks that I would love to blow up to improve the fishing. We don't touch anything. And we don't even give any assistance to the fishermen. You're not allowed to fish from a boat. We don't improve the riverbanks or the walkways or anything. If you're not up to fishing in nature, don't come here. I might have been a wee bit hard on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm compared to what I'm used to fishing in Norway, fishing in Sweden, an afternoon like this doesn't happen. It can happen every 10 years, something like that. Uh, me and uh, Håkon, my uh, buddy from uh, Sweden, we, we fished Rock Island and it was uh, absolutely amazing. We, uh, we caught 
together we caught seven fish lost probably uh, yeah. seven eight nine or ten i didn't i didn't count it's the whole experience really i mean it's um the camps are brilliant i mean it's way over and above what you could possibly expect out in the middle of nowhere um the russians are great people um great company good fishing can't really, can't really ask for more than that This is why we come to Kolovka, because every time a fish takes the fly, it might be the big fish. I think the reason is that, that uh, there's not as many 60 or 50 or 60 pounders caught here is this, these rivers are a lot tougher. We hook those fish here, but to land a 50, 60 pound fish on the Litza, you have to have all the skill in the world and you also have to have a bit of luck. Every year those fish are being hooked, but to land them, that's a different story. Jesus Christ. Chris Tarrant gets up for a quick fish before breakfast, uh, pulls out a 47 pounder. He'll never be the same, he comes back every year. Poor guy now, he, every, every time the ride goes taut, he's, he's hoping for the 50. Yeah, it is the fish of a lifetime. I mean, I just come back here because I love it. You know, the lips of the Karlovka is, is the best fishing in the world. And maybe I will catch some more big fish, but I do not expect to catch a 47 pounder. But if I do, it'd be very good. It was prima donna performance. He is one of the best guides I have met in the world. It is thanks to him that I caught the fish. Nothing to do with me. It was still on the hook. It went through the net, but then probably, uh, finally the line broke because you can't fish, uh, such a big fish go through two nets. I always remember that fish, the last moment, and I'm pointing up water, and I, I'm stroking it underwater, and the fish was looking great, it was immaculate. And suddenly, boom, the engine started, and it went away. <laughs> Here we go, Valentine. Thank you. 
I think the salmon need all the help they can get. Uh, you know, it's, they've been devastated in the, in the UK and most places in the world. I know northern Norway and just this north coast and a couple of special rivers in Canada. Um, but even still, there's so many factors that, that go into the health of a system. And there's so many of them that we can't, that are out of our control now. Very important. White cotton gloves. Protect the skin of the fish. Oh. Oh. Nice one. Yeah, yeah. Like to keep them near the water. Yeah, I think she's ready. We protect them 100% when these fish are in the river. That's one of the great things about this place. There is no road here, uh, and Peter does have complete control over what happens in the drainage. Poaching was taking place here on a massive scale. I mean massive. Like two-thirds to 75% of the fish were being taken out of the rivers indiscriminately and uh, uh, sold on the black market. Before we came here, there was no control at all. Fished everybody. Everybody who can get here. People from Ireland, from Harlov, military, helicopters, or who has friends on helicopter who can be got here from all the sea ships. It was out of control, totally. And then we started our protecting program. We started to look, we started to collect information. Where is weak points, how to protect this. In the summertime, we have observers in each rivers with communication system. If they see the poacher, they report to Rinda or Harlovka camp, and then we use a helicopter. Fish inspectors help us to go on there and find out this poacher and prosecute them. One of the poachers is quite famous here. And when we started to speak with him about this, and what to do, I don't have a job. Okay, come in the winter time, we'll speak with you, what, what can you do, and maybe we give you a job. And he became a guide. We gave him actually new life. It was not like a poacher, but like a fishing guide, because he knows everything about the fishing. And we got a lot of information from him how they poach here and how we should protect our rivers. People know if we exist here, it means the poachers will not exist here. It's one or another. Do you know the biggest problem we have now? There's not enough poaching. You try running a police force in a small town without any crime, it's very boring for the people involved. Well, it's getting a little bit like that here. We only have three or four incidents a year now. We're trying to determine part densities in this river. So it's a part of our monitoring research for Atlantic salmon. And every season we do this work on the same places, exactly in the same time. And it's helped us to see the changes, what's happened with the salmon population here. And here you can see it's a good nursery ground. So we have a lot of parts but only big size. It's probably this part, two, three, four years old. And next season, most of them will run to the sea, and two, three years later, will back as a beautiful silver fish here. It's very good. It's 
Kuyumeyiz. So, 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 stop, Billy. It's nine meters. We started to do electro fishing here in 1992. And when we come here in the first time, it was not any interesting, you know. It was a, like other rivers in Kolo Peninsula. It was really low park densities here. Probably 10 to 20 parks in 100 square meters. For the last, probably for the last six years, uh, park densities rise it up in three, four times here. Now on Zalatai River, for example, we have 137 parks in 100 square meters. So it's absolutely good because, you know, it's parks, it's the future of these rivers. If we have more parks, it means that we'll, we'll have a more fresh run of salmon. It's a good cast. Right there. Here we go. Yep. Ooh! Five casts. Yeah. Don't pull me off the stone, please. Oh shit. Very good, Dima. Look at this beauty. Maybe 18, 18 pounds, maybe. Male. Caught right in the tail of Upper Canyon. Good, strong fish. Had a few sea lice. It's been in the, in the river maybe two or three days. Eight degrees, they, they go up here in just a day if they want to. Easy. Fantastic fish. Thank you, Dima. Now we're gonna tag and make sure this yeah. fish will get back I'll in the river. You, you keep fishing, okay? Here we go! Yeah, 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 yeah! Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. <laughs> Look at this fish, it's just mad. <laughs> this fish just hammered the fly right on the top. Tell you one thing, this is better than having sex. <gasps> Madness! You do this so very gently. Yeah, because you, know, you treat your girls the same, do you? How you know? <laughs> Every season I bring to our institute really good biology material. It's more than 1,000 fish. I take a scale for them and we read the age of this salmon. And I can tell you what, this population is absolutely wild. We have a good proportion between grills and multi sea winter salmon here and they have more than 28 aging groups of salmon so it means it's this population is absolutely healthy and absolutely wild. Along with the dramatic rise of salmon par on all the rivers in the ASR the number of adult salmon returning has also been increasing every year since the protection programs began. When the temperatures and water levels come just right, thousands of large multi-sea winter salmon leap through the Karlovka Falls, disappearing into the prime spawning water on the upper river.
There's things about, especially the conservation program and the science program that I find really fascinating here. The first one, the most important one, I think, is uh, this debate that seems to want to rage around the world about whether or not catch and release works. In my home province, in Newfoundland and Labrador in Canada, uh, the debate rages on, rages on. People argue that a released fish doesn't survive to make it to the spawning ground. And it's, uh, it's amazing that I come from a country that's very wealthy, has a huge fisheries research department, but there isn't, the scientific data just isn't there to support whether or not catch and release works. There have been experiments with caught fish being put in holding tanks and this sort of thing. Here, the simple radio tagging program, when I believe it was 50 fish were caught and radio tagged, some of these fish were caught more than once a season, and then were followed and monitored through a season uh, with absolutely no mortality, all 50 salmon made it to the spawning ground. As far as I'm concerned, the debate is over. We're catching these fish two and three years later, so I think it's been a fantastic study to try to prove others wrong that don't believe in this catch and release policy. It's been, the, the, it's been a saving grace for these rivers. It's a very visual style of fishing. Dry flies cause salmon to make uh, very dramatic strikes. And it's that anticipation to watch a dry fly skating into an area where you have a feeling that that fish is sitting. And as it crosses that zone and to see that water explode underneath the fly, it's pure exhilaration. It's, it's better than something I won't name. It's that good. <laughs> I'm here for the first time with my son. He's 10 years old. He's there behind me and I can say that over the last few days he's really become a salmon fisherman. He's hooked three fish today. His cast is getting tight but he's also learning that uh, this is a resource that is fragile but that treated well it can uh, it can it can be sustained and it can be enjoyed uh, it can be enjoyed for generations. His children, his grandchildren I have no doubt will be able to come to the Atlantic Salmon Reserve and do exactly what he's doing right now and have this, this kind of an experiment. When I was president of the Fly Fishers Club of London, I organized a Russian dinner and Peter Parr spoke. And we had so many applicants for the dinner, we had to turn people away. And we invited the Russian ambassador. And the Russian ambassador was so impressed with Peter Parr that the next day he, ran, he rang the governor of the Kola and said, uh, give this man your support. And I'd like to think that the Fly Fishers Club made a contribution. Here we go. I think if you look into Russia and the way that Russians are taking care of the rivers, it's, it's embarrassing for us Scandis because they do it so much better than we do in Scandinavia. This Atlantic Salmon Reserve is it's been a reserve. It is a reserve for these fantastic fish. It's the fish are in the focus. It's not the fishermen. It's the it's the species itself. Thanks for the dance. 
this is uh, uh, run to the highest standards of international conservation. And my own view is that this should be made a world heritage site. If the guests can feel involved and they feel that efforts are being made to improve, if you can add to efforts actual results which we can show them, then you will get happiness. But what's the point of doing it if somebody's not happy about it? It's almost like saying, what's the point of the world if there are no human beings? So the two go together. The most important thing for me now is to leave Russia in a way where, the, the, where this is run by rules and regulations, just as it says on that cross up there that the church put here. This cross watches over sacred, cherished surroundings as an example uh, to man for his duty to nature for future generations. And the church chose those words, and that is now my life. And that is what I want to do before I go. I found the thing that suited me best right here. Very strange. If uh, I'd been told I'd finish up with Russia, in Russia, 20 years ago, doing what I do, I'd have said you were absolutely mad. Anyway, this has been my destiny. When a, when a species is going down, you just let nature do what nature does best and just, you know, release the fish. Let it spawn. Um, so. Yeah, well, I, I would love to take this back home to Iceland and, and tell them, do this this way. We are not doing it this way in Iceland, I'm sorry to say. Look at Kalob Kalitsa today and Rinda too. Everybody wants to go, go here. This is paradise for salmon fishermen from all over the world. That's because they, these rivers are managed the right way. It's wild fish, lots of wild fish and big fish. And then great looking rivers, of course. We've got a lot of rivers in, in Russia, but unfortunately we don't have any history of the, how to manage these rivers. In Soviet time it was absolutely different, Soviet time is gone, but new rules across Russia is coming very slowly. And I think this operation is the best and it's leading other companies to think about how to manage the different rivers and the different circumstances. And I think it's a very big thing for Russia, which Peter, Peter's done here. I feel it's very important because it will spread and will help Russia. If they mess it up when I've gone, and this is plundered, which is possible, I'm going to do my best to make sure it's not plundered. And I'm working with government to make sure it's not plundered. But if it is, well, you can't legislate after you're, after you're gone. But I will have tried, <clears throat> and isn't that all that matters? <laughs>